Hello everyone and I welcome you all in lecture number 5 in the series of lectures on Economic Survey 2021-22. Today we are going to look at one of the most crucial topics of Economic Survey and perhaps Indian economy which is chapter number 7 based on agriculture and food management. We have been following a practice where we first look at the blueprint of the chapter and then we get into the details. We would follow the same strategy for this topic. So guys, we divide this topic into four important pillars. The first pillar of this topic that we are going to look into would talk about agriculture. Under agriculture, we are going to look into two crucial areas. The first is general trends and policy issues related to agriculture. When we look into the policy issues, these are the same issues which are going to tell us about the performance of Indian agriculture in last one or two years. For example, we would look at the performance of Indian agriculture in terms of investment, credit, irrigation, agriculture market, agriculture price policy, diversification. And these are the things that we need to keep in mind while formulating agriculture policies also. So these can also be considered as performance metrics of Indian agriculture. In this economic survey, a lot of importance has been given to crop diversification and natural farming. We will look into it in detail. When we come to the other side, we see that there is something called as allied sector. We will pay attention to allied sector because we very well know that most of the Indian farmers are small and marginal farmers. For small and marginal farmers, their dependence on crop cultivation is less and they are not able to earn huge income through crop cultivation. So they depend upon allied activities like fisheries, livestock, dairy, eggs and meat and sweet revolution. Economic survey has given more importance to allied sector in this year's edition. And specifically, they have talked about sweet revolution and government of India's effort in terms of sweet revolution, which is beekeeping. We would also look into food processing industry because it's a sunrise industry. It creates a lot of jobs and India is trying to export a lot of processed foods. So we would look into some of important schemes of food processing industries. For example, formalization of micro food processing enterprises, FME. We are also going to look into Sampada and Operation Green, which is also called as TOPS, tomatoes, onion and potatoes. These are the three schemes we are going to look into. Then we are going to look into food management. So what is food management all about? Whom are we trying to target when we do food management in a country like India? Farmers, consumers, poor, vulnerable section. Who is our focal point? We are going to look at the concept of food management. Under food management, we will also look into schemes like Pradhan Mantri, Krishi Vikas Yojana and fortification of food grains. You know, we severely lack nutrients like iron, vitamins. So what is government of India doing to help us get both food as well as nutrients? Is government of India doing anything? So we are going to examine it. We are also going to examine a very crucial question related to food subsidy. And you know, food management and food subsidy, they become very important, especially in the context of COVID. Then we are going to look into one very crucial thing which has been given in this year's economic survey, which is called as Situation Assessment Survey 2021. You know, if you want to create good policies, which genuinely help the farmers, you have to find out what is the source of income of the farmer and the source of income of the farmer, is it changing over a period of time or is it the same? For example, if I am government of India and I have to create policies to improve farmers income, I need to see what are the activities which my farmers are doing. Are my farmers big? Are my farmers small? Do my farmers have a lot of land or do they have very small land size? These are some of the crucial questions that are examined in situation assessment survey. Based on this, we have some policy prescriptions which we feel that the government of India can adhere to to create good policies for agriculture. So let us begin the topic. So guys, now let us have a look at the absolute basics related to agriculture and allied sector. See, we have three very, very important sectors of the economy, isn't it? All of us know that. So that's your agriculture and allied sector. This is industries and this is services. Now suppose India earns an income of 100 rupees. What is the contribution of agriculture in India's national income? See, it's 18.8%, which means if India earns 100 rupees as income, 
the contribution of agriculture is 18.8 rupees. What is the contribution of industries in India's income? 25.9% and the contribution by services 55%. We have already looked at this in the previous videos. Now, look at this particular sector, agriculture and allied sector. The name itself is making it clear that there is something more than cultivation of crops in this sector. So, what do you mean by agriculture and allied sector? What are the components? So, in India, you divide agriculture and allied sector into some components. What are those components? First is crop production. Second is livestock, which is animal rearing, isn't it? And then forestry and logging and fishing and aquaculture. So, these are the four components of agriculture and allied sector. So, guys, do you remember when we were doing industries, I told you some of the subsectors related to industries also. These are very important things, absolute basic information, which an aspirant is expected to know for exams like UPSC. All right. Now, uh, see, the most important entity in agriculture are our farmers, isn't it? So, based on the size of land that they hold, how do we divide Indian farmers or Indian farm sector? So, based on the size of the land holding, we divide Indian farmers into the following categories. The first is small and marginal farmers. So, those farmers who have a land holding whose size is less than 2 hectares, they are called as small and marginal farmers. Those farmers whose land holding is between 2 to 10 hectares, they are called as medium farmers. Those farmers whose land holding is greater than 10 hectares, they are called as large farmers, right? So, this is typically the absolute basic related to agriculture and allied sector. Now, let us have a look at some of the most important trends related to agriculture and allied sector as well as its components. So, we are dividing this discussion into two parts now. One, we will have a look at the overall agriculture and allied sector and the trend and then we are going to look at the components of agriculture and allied sector and we are going to look at their trend. Alright, so first overall and then component wise. So, so, what do you find in India in terms of overall analysis? So, to show you the overall analysis, I have got some pictures or I have got some diagrams and figures from the economic survey. Look at this please. This is figure number one. It shows what is the growth rate, overall growth rate of agriculture and allied sector in India over a period of time. See, if you look carefully, you will see that around 2016, 17, this is the growth rate of agriculture. It comes down around 2018, 19 and then 2019, it is picking up 2020. Despite COVID, look at the contribution of agriculture in the Indian economy. Look at the growth rate of agriculture, almost close to 3.6%, 3.9%. So, during COVID and post COVID, perhaps agriculture was the only sector where we saw such a huge positive rate of growth even during COVID and after COVID. It continued to show brightness and good results. See, 3.6%, 3.9%. So, the first trend that we note about overall growth in agriculture is that there was a positive rate of growth even during COVID and after COVID. The second fact that we note about agriculture is that, you know, there is something very interesting. See, so we are talking about agriculture and allied sector. So, let us pick up the year 2018 and 19. See, this is your 2018 and 19. Now, in the year 2018 and 19, what was the rate of growth of crops? Negative, see, minus 1.6%. In the year 2018 and 19, what was the rate of growth of livestock? 8.5%. In the year 2018 and 19, what was the rate of growth of forestry? You see, in the year 2018 and 19, what was the rate of growth of fishing? 9%. So, if you notice carefully, even though the crop production came down, see 18, 19, crop production was negative. But something happened in the Indian agriculture and allied sector that overall rate of growth of agriculture and allied sector was positive. Even though your crop production is showing a negative growth, see, 
if you look at 18 and 19, we had a positive rate of growth of 2.6%, right? It could have been minus also, but it was not negative because of something very important. What was that important thing? It was livestock, it was forestry, it was fishing. So, so economic survey this year says that livestock and fishing, especially livestock and fishing, have been so strong and positive in India that even when our crop production falls, livestock and fishing perform in such a way that they are able to pull up the rate of growth of overall agricultural sector. That is the message in this figure. Fine. So, livestock and fishing have such a positive impact that even when crop production is negative, livestock and fishing pulls up our agricultural rate of growth. Now, let us come to figure number three. What is it uh, saying, you know? So, this figure number three shows that what is the long term trend in agricultural sector. So, if you look at the growth rate of agricultural sector, okay. So, so what is this figure show? Percentage share of gross value of agriculture and allied sector in total gross value added. So, if you look at the overall national income of India, what is the contribution of agriculture over a period of time? So, if you look carefully, see 18.2, 18.6, you know, 18, 18, 18, 20, 18. So, overall, it won't be, you know, it won't be a, a wrong fact to, to claim that in general, overall, since quite few years, the contribution of agriculture in our national income has been roughly around 18 percent. That is what economic survey says. And if you look at the contribution of agriculture during COVID in our total national income, it jumps to around 20.2 percent, right? This is what it says. Now, so, so these are basically the three things that we have written here. Number one, so, so let us repeat and recapture everything very quickly. So, number one, we saw that even during COVID, Agriculture and allied sector showed a positive rate of growth, 3.6% and 3.9%. Second fact that we saw was, you know, livestock and fishing have exerted a very positive effect on overall agriculture. And then the third thing that we see is long-term contribution of agriculture, long-term trend or average contribution of agriculture and allied sector in our national income has been roughly around 18%. During COVID, it became almost 20 or 20.2 percent. Now, let us look at the second facet of agriculture. So, you see, this is very interesting and this is where I feel that a question might be asked in UPSC prelims. See how. So, this says gross value added in agriculture and allied sector and its components. So, if you look at the component of agriculture, for example, crops, livestock, forestry and logging, fishing and aquaculture, which of these components have contributed very significantly in India's agricultural growth? The answer is livestock, fishing and aquaculture. Now, let us look at a very interesting figure which is given in economic survey. This one is a very, very interesting figure because it shows you something very unique about Indian economy, especially of Indian agriculture. And I personally feel that we must know this and keep it in mind before appearing in any exam like UPSC. See, what does the figure say? It says percentage share of gross value added of crops and allied sector in total agriculture. So what it is showing is that I told you that agricultural sector, agriculture and allied sector has different components like crops, livestock, fishing, all these things, isn't it? So, this figure shows what has been the contribution of these small subsectors like crops, fishing, livestock, forestry, what has been the contribution of each of these components in agriculture over a period of time, which means are the farmers only dependent on crop cultivation, which they were doing 10 years back? Are they doing the same thing? Or are they moving away from crop cultivation to new areas also? This is what this diagram shows. So see, if you look carefully, you will see that this side is the crop side. So guys, if this to this overall, if look at this length, please. If this is the overall contribution of agriculture in national income, I told you, let's say around 18%, somewhere around 18%. So, if this is the overall contribution, 
what was the contribution of crops what was the contribution of livestock forestry and fishing so within agriculture who is contributing more so see around 2011 12 the contribution of crops was almost 12.1% now what is the contribution of crops today 10.7% has it come down yes it has come down now let us look at the contribution of livestock if you look at livestock earlier around 2011 12 it was 4% now it is 5.2% it has gone up if you look at fishing and aquaculture see the last part it's 0.8% in 2011 12 it's 1.2% now which means it has gone up so what do we conclude we again conclude the same thing that over a period of time the importance of livestock and fishing in india's agriculture is improving so livestock and fishing are turning out to be very important sectors of agriculture and allied sector now we would just take a, a few seconds pause and we will we will discuss something very crucial so if you are a policy maker of india tomorrow you will be a policy maker of india isn't it so when you become the policy maker of india a question will be there in front of you as to how to design agricultural policies when you design agricultural policies you have to keep in mind the reality of the day that livestock and fishing are turning out to be very important source of income for farmers in addition to crops so when we frame agricultural policies our policy will be incomplete if we don't pay adequate attention to livestock and fishing also see why most of the farmers in india are small and marginal which means they hold less than 2 hectares of land for those farmers who don't have huge piece of land their one of the main sources of livelihood be livestock and fishing which means crop cultivation livestock and fishing poultry all these things are going hand in hand it is an additional source of revenue for the farmers so when you frame agricultural policies you have to keep this thing in mind all right so so there is this this small box which i have given you know in india there is a there was this committee which was created to find out how to double farmers income so so that committee gave a report whereby they said okay do these things to double the farmers income in that committee report they gave a very nice nice idea they said that dairy livestock poultry fisheries horticulture these are the engines of high growth in india so if you want our agriculture and allied sector to grow if you want that the income of farmers should double if you want that the gdp of india or growth of india should be very fast then you need to pay attention to dairy livestock poultry fisheries horticulture these are the very important areas for indian growth all right so that is what is mentioned in the report you can use this thing in your essay in your interview in your main answer you can quote this now guys let us get into agricultural production and see what is the trend in agricultural production in india so let's see what is the total food grain production in india see around 2019 20 how much did we produce total agricultural production food grains 297.5 million tons now around 2020 21 what was our agricultural production 308.65 million tons of course our agricultural production has increased everybody knows it now what are some of the important food grains that we have been producing so see these are some of the important food grains that we have been producing in terms of overall agricultural production these are the important ones so number one rice wheat coarse cereals pulses oil seeds cotton and sugar these are the important agricultural produce of india we are going to talk about two very important things oil seeds and sugar very very important right because the current economic survey gives important to these two and they have discussed it in detail so we will also do the same all right so let us first have a look at the sugar sector you know if you talk about agricultural based industries which is the number one agricultural based industry in india cotton industry and which is the second most important agriculture based industry in india sugar industry how many farmers are directly or indirectly involved in the sugar industry almost 5 crore farmers their livelihood depends upon sugar industry that is its importance now let's talk about india in general 
you know that India is the largest consumer of sugar in the world. We consume a lot of sugar. So, so you know, talk about tea, coffee, uh, sugar, talk about gold. We are either the largest or one of the largest consumers. So here in terms of sugar, we are the largest consumer of sugar in the world. If you talk about production, we are the second largest producer of sugar in the world. All right. So just remember these one or two small facts. Maybe who knows these questions may be asked in, in the exam. Now, guys, let us look at this important, uh, important graph which has been given in the economic survey. It says production and consumption level of sugar. So I told you, we are the second largest producer and the largest consumer of sugar. Let us look at some of the trend there. So see, this is a very interesting graph which I found. So, so I took it for you guys. See, so this is your production. This is your consumption. If you look carefully, you will see that we have always produced more than what we have consumed. See, around 2011-12, production is more than consumption. So, production is more than consumption. Just in the year 2016-17, this is the only year, in last 10 years, this is the only year where our production was less than consumption. Otherwise, everywhere, our production has been more than consumption. But after 2016-17, see, I have given you this box. After 2016-17, which means starting from 2017-18, 18-19, 19-20, 20-21. If you look at these four years, our production has been greater than consumption, you know, almost consistently. So UPSC might ask you a question that overall in last 10 years or so, has our production been greater than consumption in general? Yes. There is this one exceptional year 2016-17 when our production was lower than consumption and after that, which means recently. So UPSC might ask you a question that off late or recently, what has been the trend in production and consumption of sugar in India? So you should say that production of sugar off late or recently has been greater than consumption in India. Fine. Now, what are the initiatives for sugar sector in India? Very, very crucial point, isn't it? So let's see. You know, guys, just like government of India gives minimum support prices to crops, similarly, like rice, wheat, etc. Similarly, government of India gives a support price for sugar. What is the support price that the government of India gives? So there is a price called as fair and remunerative price, FRP, which is given for sugarcane producers in India. So if you are a farmer who is a sugarcane producer, government of India gives you an assured price called as FRP, fair and remunerative price. This is the price at which the sugar factories or sugar mills have to procure or buy sugar cane from the farmers. All right. So FRP is the price at which the sugar mills have to buy sugar cane from the farmers. Earlier, before 2009, before October 2009, there was a different price which was given to farmers, sugar cane farmers. That price was called as, see this one. That price was called as statutory minimum prices SMP. But from October 2009, this system has been scrapped and it has been replaced with fair and remunerative prices. This is the new price system from October 20, 2009. What has been the trend in FRP? The trend has been increasing, which means the government of India has been fixing higher and higher FRP for sugarcane farmers every year. See, look at the long term trend, it's going up. The long term trend is like this. Now, this is the price which is fixed by central government, FRP. Now, can state governments provide a higher price to farmers than FRP? Yes. The state governments can provide state advised prices, SAP, which is generally higher than FRP. Because if state governments are giving a price which is lower than FRP, it won't make sense. So it is higher than FRP. So state governments can also try to help the sugarcane farmers. Now this is very interesting. It says cane reservation area. So guys, suppose I am a sugar 
cane factory you know you know i am running a sugar cane factory whereby from sugar cane i am converting sugar cane to sugar right so i am a sugar mill basically i am the owner of a sugar mill i have to procure sugar cane from the farmers government of india says that if there is a sugar cane mill or 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 factory they have to procure sugar cane from the farmers within a given radius so if i have a factory then within a given radius or distance whosoever farmer is willing to sell the sugar cane to me i have to procure my sugar cane from those farmers so it says that sugar mills buy sugar cane from farmers in a specified radius called as cane reservation area this has been given to support the farmers now let us look at another another program which the government of india is running so you know there is something called as ethanol blended petrol that is a biofuel you know what government of india does so we have a program whereby we take petrol and we mix ethanol in it that is called as ethanol blended petrol these days we are mixing 20% ethanol to petrol and then we sell it as commercial fuel it's called biofuel now government of india tells these sugar mills that if you have excess sugar then you should direct it towards this program called as ethanol blended petrol program fine so this is what government of india is promoting now government of india is also actively supporting these sugar mills to export sugar out of india so these are some of the important steps undertaken by government of india so guys now let us talk about agricultural credit see let me take you to a typical village and let us see what happens to the farmer there so suppose guys you are a farmer what is the first thing that would come to your mind whenever you are thinking about agricultural production the first thing that would come to your mind is seeds fertilizer pesticides weedicides isn't it why because these are the inputs of cultivation if you don't have these inputs how will you cultivate crops but if you want to have these inputs you need money a farmer in india typical farmer in india is not necessarily very rich i told you that in india most of the farmers that we have are small and marginal farmers so if the farmers have to get these inputs like seeds fertilizer pesticides etc they need money and for that money where were they going conventionally or historically if you see the farmers used to go to the village money lender a village money lender is a private individual so suppose guys you are a farmer i am a money lender you come to me for money i will give you 1 lakh rupees but i will take your property papers i will take the papers ownership papers of your land i will take your cattle etc why because i need some collateral and assurance a farmer in india when they used to take some money from the money lender suppose the farmer is not able to return the money what happens if you are not able to return the money the money lender would keep your land keep your property and you are always in debt of the money lender which means your exploitation just started and your exploitation would not end in your in your generation but your exploitation would continue for subsequent generation your children will also suffer the same problem they will be in debt so the government of india tried to find out a solution to remove this problem the solution to remove this problem was called as kisan credit card so kisan credit card was started in india whereby the farmers can use kisan credit card to buy inputs and to fulfill their other requirements so let us have a look at the kisan credit card and its evolution and what are the latest reforms related to kisan credit card all these things we are going to cover under this section called as agricultural credit so you know the government of india had fixed a target that this is the amount of money that they have to give in the field of agriculture to farmers now was the government of india able to give that money to the farmers it is very important to know this so let us see we find that in the year 2021 whatever the government of india had decided to give to the farmers they were able to give more than that which means we were able to give more credit than what we had planned so this is a very good sign it means agriculture was performing well and we already saw that even during covid the rate of growth of agriculture was 3.6% later on 3.9% which means agricultural sector was growing with consistency now let us have a look at what is kisan credit card so see this is the story which i just told you that if you are a farmer 
And if you're taking money from a money lender, village money lender, you have to pay very high rate of interest and you will always be in debt. But if you take Kisan credit card, if you are a farmer, government of India said, use Kisan credit card and take loan at a low rate of interest. This is that concept. So the concept of Kisan credit card started in India in 1998, whereby Kisan credit card could be used by the farmer to buy the inputs. In 2004, the government of India expanded the use of Kisan credit card and now the farmers could use the Kisan credit card in allied and non-farm activities also. Remember allied sector. Similarly, in 2012, the government of India made another change in the Kisan credit card. Kisan credit card was simplified and now electronic Kisan credit card was promoted. In the year 2020, the government of India revised Kisan credit card and they launched a revised Kisan credit card with new features. Now the government of India said, especially during the COVID, government of India released Atmanirbhar Bharat package. In that package, the government of India said that they are going to release 2.5 lakh crore rupees. See, uh, or, or rather to be precise, the government of India said they are going to release 2 lakh crore rupees to 2.5 crore farmers through Kisan credit card at low rate of interest. So what did the government of India say? That they are going to give benefits of credit at low rate of interest to 2.5 crore farmers. And what is the total sum that the government promised to release under Atmanirbhar Bharat? 2 lakh crore rupees. Now the question arises that in the new Kisan credit card, what are the features? Where can a farmer use a Kisan credit card these days? So you see, a farmer can use Kisan credit card for cultivation, which is crop, for post-harvest. What is the meaning of post-harvest? So you see, whenever you remove the crop from the field, if you are a farmer, what do you do with the crop then? After you remove it from the field, you transport it, you store it. So transportation, storage, distribution, all these things are called as post-harvest operations. So farmers not only require money for buying seeds and fertilizers, they also require money and funds for post-harvest operations. Plus there is one more interesting thing which has been added to the Kisan credit card. See, this is very interesting. Suppose I am a farmer. Do you think that agricultural income is very stable in India? That if I am a farmer, I'll keep on getting monthly income on a regular basis? No. So sometimes the situation arises where a farmer also requires fund for survival because he has to feed his family, take care of his family. So can a farmer use Kisan credit card for consumption? Yes. Even for own consumption and to run his family, farmer can use Kisan credit card and take some credit. Then let us have a look at this point number five, which is very, very important. Now Kisan credit card is being also issued for animal husbandry and fisheries. Earlier it was not. So now this has been specifically mentioned that Kisan credit card has been expanded to animal husbandry and fisheries. This is your Kisan credit card. So guys, now let us talk about irrigation in India. You see, if we talk about the use of water in India, we can see three different categories. So suppose 100 liters of water are used in India. So out of 100 liters, 80 liters of water is used in agriculture. 13 liters of water is used in industries. And, and for example, for household purposes, so it's 7%. So agriculture uses 80% of India's water. Industries use 13% and utilities like household, etc. They use 7% of water. Now, if you look at the irrigation profile of India, see agriculture is consuming a lot of water. So we need to know how much is the level of irrigation in this country. You know, India is geographically a very big country. 329 million hectares is the landmass of India. So, so for example, suppose this is the map of India. If you look at the map of India, suppose this area that you see is the area where agriculture is carried on. Suppose this is the only area where cultivation is carried on. So if you look at the net sown area of India, which means, for example, agriculture practices are happening. So if, if this is that area, then 49% of it. So this is the net sown area, okay? So net sown area roughly can be taken as an area where agriculture is happening. So out of the net sown area, 49% is irrigated area. That is the level of irrigation in India. Out of that 49%, what is the contribution of canal irrigation? 
roughly 19.6 percent and what is the contribution of groundwater irrigation it's 29.4 percent so 49 percent is the level of irrigation in india out of net zone area out of which the contribution of canal and contribution of groundwater is this much now if we talk about one fact which is very worrisome and the government keeps an eye over this the fact is the level of groundwater availability versus how much you are taking out from the ground i'll give you an example so suppose guys every year in india under the ground the availability of water is 100 liters if we take out just 10 liter from that that means it is sustainable there is no problem because 90 liters surplus water is there inside the ground but if the availability of groundwater is 100 liters and we keep on extracting 50 liters, 60 liters, 70 liters and if we keep on extracting 90 liters out of 100, it becomes dangerous situation. So you know what is the average state of groundwater in India? So that is measured by this formula called as groundwater development. So groundwater development means out of the net annual groundwater availability, what is the annual groundwater draft means whatever is the annual groundwater discharge this is the availability this is the discharge so out of every 100 liter of groundwater availability annually discharge is 63 liters this is not a very good situation in fact if you go to some parts of india you will notice that out of 100 liters water annually available we take entire 100 liter this is very very dangerous and unsustainable in other parts of india there are many states where out of 100 liters of water we are extracting more than 70 liters so government of india has given that list in the current year's economic survey and it says look at this map if you look at this part of india you will clearly see that the ground water extraction is very very high and what are those areas delhi punjab haryana rajasthan so out of 100 liters we extract 100 liters if you go to some parts of india for example look at this part and please look at this part if you see carefully then if 100 liters of water are there in the ground annually out of that we extract 70 to 100 liters very very high dangerous so which are those states for example here you will find himachal pradesh you will find up you will find chandigarh puducherry and here you will find tamil nadu these are the states where we extract a lot of water from the ground now you know two facts now first of all we are extracting a lot of water and we are extracting it a large number of states so in many states there is this problem so what is the solution what is the policy that that government needs to adopt to control this problem in future so there are two things that the government needs to do now number one the government of india needs to make sure that the ground water you know recharge happens at a faster place all right so so the pace of groundwater discharge must be good and number two the government of india must create a plan so that we can conserve groundwater so number one we have to conserve it don't extract more than what you can fill and number two keep on letting the groundwater be naturally replenished these are the two things that we need to do now what are some of the government of india's initiatives in the field of irrigation so you know government of india has started a program called as pradhan mantri krishi sichai yojana in the year 2015 what are the two important components of the scheme what does government want to do so actually government of india has two things in mind number one the government of india wants that all the farmers of india should get access to irrigation which means availability of irrigation is number one agenda of the government and the second agenda of the government is to use water more efficiently so see guys if you go to different crop fields you will see that many a times we just put water in the in the field even if the amount of crops are less so a lot of water is wasted so to prevent it and to make the water more efficient use of the water more efficient government of india has adopted a principle called as more crop per drop which means that the government is saying that with every drop of water 
the crop production should increase which means we use water in such a way that not even a single drop of water is wasted that is called as water use efficiency i'll give you an example so for example suppose that you take 3 hours to read a newspaper every day ha huh? one newspaper 3 hours but suppose you develop a technique so that you can finish that entire newspaper in 1 hour only that is called as efficiency similarly suppose to produce 100 kg of rice we need 50 liters of water but the government of india can find out a method or a technique so that we can produce 100 kg of rice only using 10 liters of water which means we are using the water more product productively and more efficiently this is called water use efficiency now what is government of india doing to promote all these things government of india is promoting two things number one the government of india is promoting micro irrigation concept in india what is micro irrigation i'll show show it to you through a diagram so micro irrigation would mean drip irrigation and sprinkler irrigation what is drip irrigation you see there is this this hose there is this pipe and there are crops on both the sides so what it has been done is is that through this hose the water flows this is the main channel of the water and then there are branches it's like capillaries you know small thin pipes attached to this wider hose and from here the water is directly you know given at the roots of the plants this is a very efficient method of using water because at places where water is not required we don't use water we put water only near the roots of the plant so this is a very efficient way called as drip irrigation and water percolates on the roots you know in a slow motion so so water comes out of the pipe only to the extent that it can be absorbed by the soil and it can be used by the plants productively extra excess amount of water is not released so controlled amount controlled water pressure in these lines now then second one is sprinkler irrigation you can see here that instead of putting water on the ground and wasting it we are releasing water at a high pressure using these sprinklers so that water can you know be be circulated and it can be taken to all the plants in a particular locality so this is efficient use of water so the government of india is promoting this concept called as micro irrigation the second important initiative in the field of micro irrigation only is that government of india has set up a fund with nabard a rupees 5000 crore fund has been set up with nabard so that if state governments want to promote or give incentives to their farmers to use micro irrigation they can use that fund so a separate fund has been created what is the name of that fund that fund is called as micro irrigation fund 5000 crore with nabard and it was created in 2018 and 19 so these are the two important things in this field of micro irrigation now let us get into the details of the workings of agricultural market in india so have you guys ever heard of something called as a monday market tuesday market wednesday market have you ever you know got a chance to go to a village area and have you ever witnessed these weekly markets or monthly markets that are or organized in the village areas maybe yes you know what is so interesting about these markets so the farmers from a locality they gather in a particular market let's say every week or every month and they directly sell their products to the consumers so there is a bargain which happens between farmers who are the sellers and the consumers who want to buy the product state governments or central government they do not regulate these markets these are called as unregulated agricultural market also called as hats then there are regulated agricultural markets which are regulated by state governments through apmc act so if you look carefully in india you will find that there are close to 7000 regulated markets in india and these markets are regulated by agricultural produce market committee apmc act and and who controls agriculture and agricultural market state governments so now before i tell you some of the important decisions that the government has taken in the terms of reforms related to agricultural market let us have an overview of how agricultural market works a very brief overview so see 
if you want to look at the working of agricultural market we need to look at two three important things so this is agricultural market this is the person who controls and regulates this market these are the farmers and these are the buyers or traders who have come in the market to buy the food grain let us see how the system works so agriculture market is controlled by state government state government appoints a person called as arhatia he is also called as a middleman state government gives license to this person to manage this market when the farmer comes with his crop in this market the first thing that he has to do is he has to contact the arhatia so this arhatia will tell the farmer that hey mr farmer let me first check the quality of your crop then the weight of the crop is checked if the farmer requires storage facility warehouses cold storage are provided drying facility packaging facilities also provided for all these services starting from checking quality to drying to putting things in warehouse all weighing all these things all these activities are chargeable and a farmer has to pay a service charge to the arhatia for these services once the farmer has paid the charges then the arhatia tells the farmer that since these infrastructures like warehouse cold storage etc has been developed in the market for development of these infrastructure something called as market development fee also has to be paid by farmer to this arhatia after that the farmer also has to pay a fee a commission to the arhatia because he is giving services so so it depends upon the state government in many states if you add the service charge market fee and arhatia fee it comes out to be around 6 6.5% some state it goes up to even 9 to 10% also so don't you think that the farmers have to pay a lot considering that most of the indian farmers are small and marginal yes now look what arhatia does so arhatia would tell the farmer that hey farmer based on the quality of your crop i am ready to give you 30 rupees a kg the farmer says no but my crop is of good quality arhatia says no according to me it is worth 30 rupees a kg you have to sell it to me then this farmer sells the crop to arhatia for 30 rupees and arhatia then sells the same crop to traders for 100 rupees so what is the profit that the arhatia keeps 70 rupees so arhatia earns this 70 rupees plus also gets a fee this is how the agricultural market works the government of india had introduced three reforms in the field of agriculture but because of continued agitation in the country the government of india had to call back those reforms so currently the agriculture market works like this now let us get into economic survey and see what have been some of the recent reforms related to agricultural market before we do that can i ask you a very simple question see don't you feel that the pressure or burden of creation of this infrastructure here should not be put on the farmers of course not so what has the government of india done under atmanirbhar bharat package the government of india created a scheme so that if this apmc mandi for example this apmc mandi this is called as apmc mandi so if they want to create some infrastructure government of india has created a scheme whereby these apmc mandis can take loan from the banks at subsidized rate of interest and they can construct this infrastructures similarly for example i am a private individual or i am a businessman if i also want to construct infrastructures related to agriculture especially post harvest operations what is the meaning of post harvest so once you remove the crop from the agricultural field whatever you do with the crop is called post harvest like storage transportation and if i have for example fruits like apple or mangoes if they are raw i will put them for ripening so that they are ready to be consumed so that is also post harvest so if i am a private individual i am a company i am a public private partnership model or i am apmc mandi if i want to create post harvest infrastructure in the field of agriculture i can take loan from the government of india at subsidized rates and when i take these loans government of india will give my guarantee to the bank and government of india will tell them give them the loans so that they can construct infrastructure this is one of the new reforms let's see what the name of the reform is so see it is called as agricultural infrastructure fund 2020 under it the government of india has allocated 1 lakh crore rupees under atmanirbhar bharat 
so as to provide medium and long term debt finance for post harvest infrastructure. What is the meaning of debt finance? Loan. Post harvest would mean supply chain, waterhouse, silos, sorting, grading, cold chain, primary processing center which means very basic processing. Then ripening chambers where raw fruits would be converted into ready to eat fruits. So these are some of the post harvest operations. For these things, who all can take loan from the banks? So agricultural enterprises, public private partnership, farmers, farmer producer organization which means group of farmers. Then startups, self-help groups and APMC mandis. All of these can take loan from the bank to create infrastructure. When you take loan from a bank, you will get subsidy in the interest rate. For example, guys, if you are taking loan from a bank for creation of agricultural infrastructure, suppose the normal bank rate is 7%, loan rate over the loan is 7%. But this bank will give you the same loan for 4% interest rate, which means 3% interest rate subsidy. And the government of India takes your guarantee also so that you can get easy loans. So this is agriculture infrastructure fund. This is reform number one. Now let us look at more reforms. So now we come to something very interesting called as ENAM. What is ENAM? ENAM means E-National Agricultural Market. So for example guys suppose I am a farmer. I have very good quality wheat. So what I do is I go to my APMC Mandi and I see that there is a computer there. On that computer I upload the quality of my crop quality of my wheat and I also upload the quantity of my wheat. In that APMC Mandi, there will be a person who will help me to package my wheat in nice bags. Then I will upload that information on the internet called as ENAM portal. On that portal, anybody across India who wants to buy that wheel, they will quote some price. That what is the price they are ready to pay. So suppose somebody in Karnataka is saying that they are ready to pay 100 rupees. Somebody in Andhra is paying 150 rupees. Somebody in UP or Jammu Kashmir are paying 160 rupees. So farmers can extract good prices based on the quality of their product if they sell their product online. So ENAM is a mechanism through which farmers can sell their product online also. So for the promotion of ENAM, the government of India provides software services and also provides 75 lakh rupees financial help to every APMC Mandi who goes online. Now, by 2021, if you look at the data, 1000 Mandis in 18 state governments and union territories already started ENAM facility for the farmer. Now guys, let us look at something very interesting called as farmer producer organization. Let me ask you a question. Suppose you are an industrialist. I am an individual farmer. You know 86% of the farmers in India have small piece of land which means my production will be low. So if I come to an industrialist to sell my product, I am an individual farmer. Do you think I will be able to get good prices? Impossible. If I have some product, if I am a small farmer, do you think I can create warehouse on my own? Impossible. If I go to take bank loan, is it easy for me to, to, to take bank loan? Very difficult. So what we can do is we can create a group. And when as a group we approach a bank, we get loans at good uh, interest rates. If as a group we go to somebody to sell our product, we can bargain for good prices. So whenever you create a group, whenever you are a producer and you create a group, it's called producer organization. Let's go to village area and see if there are producer organizations. Example. So suppose you are an artist, a weaver in a village. If many artists and weaver come together and they create a group, they are called as producer organization for artists or weavers. Similarly, if farmers, for example, those farmers who are into dairy, who are into fishing, if they come together and create a group and they register themselves with the government of India as that group, they would be called as producer organization for farmers or simply farmer producer organization. So farmer producer organization is a group of farmers who have registered themselves and they work like private companies. So every farmer who is a part of it is owner also. What is the benefit of farmer producer organization? So you see suppose these are the group of farmers who have created farmer producer organization. They have registered themselves. 
So if they go to a bank, they can get credit easily because bank trusts the group behavior. They can arrange inputs collectively. It would be so easy. If they go to sell their products, they can bargain for very good prices. And if they want to create post-harvest infrastructure like storage and transportation, it becomes very easy for them. So, so what is the difference between a farmer producer organization and a cooperative? You must have heard of cooperative. Cooperative is also a group of farmers, but they register themselves under Cooperative Society Act. But farmer producer organization, they register themselves more like a private firm, a group of farmers where every farmer is one of the owner of that group. So this is how they behave. Government of India does not interfere in the workings of the farmer producer organization. But in a cooperative, yes, government of India has some kind of regulatory powers where they control it through the registrar of the cooperative. These are some of the differences. So what does basically government of India want? So basically the government of India is, is aiming to increase the number of farmer producer organization in this country. So see, there is a scheme which Government of India is currently running called as Formation and Promotion of 10,000 FPOs Scheme, whereby the Government of India wants to create 10,000 new farmer producer organization by the year 27-28 because it is a way to empower the farmer actually and increase their income. So this is your farmer producer organization. Who all can create farmer producer organization? As, as we discussed, milk producers, fishermen, etc. So now guys, let us start a very important section called as agricultural price policy. Let me ask you a simple question. If you are the government of India and you are creating agricultural price policy, whom are you going to keep in the center as the focal point of the policy? Are you going to protect consumers? Are you going to give good prices to the farmers? Or are you going to take care of both of them? What are you going to do as a policy maker? I know the obvious answer would be that you have to take care of both consumers and, <clears throat> and farmers. You know something very interesting. When we started to have agricultural price policy in India, you know the focal point of, of the government of India was consumers. We wanted to make sure that the consumers get the food or the crops or the food grains at affordable prices. But later on, when we became independent and as we progressed, we started to give due importance to farmers also. And we said that the job or the aim of agricultural price policy will be threefold. Number one, to make sure that the farmers get good prices. Number two, to make sure that the consumers are getting food at affordable prices. And number three, we promote a diversification in the crop production in this country. These were the three important aims that we have been following in agricultural price policy. Now, in terms of giving good prices to the farmers, we follow a system called as minimum support prices. What is minimum support prices? So CACP, based on various factors of production, they propose a minimum price that the government of India must provide to the farmers for certain crops. The government of India then goes through the details and they announce something called as minimum support price even before the sowing has begun. So before the farmer enters into the field and starts to plant the seeds, minimum support price is announced by government of India. So the government of India is currently announcing Minimum support prices, MSP for 22 crops. It is an assured price given by government of India. So what are those crops? So 14 Kharif crops are there. We have to just look at this list and we have to keep a few names in mind. Now how many Rabi crops are there? Six. We must memorize these. Very important for UPSC prelims. And then there are two commercial crops, Jute and Copra. Copra is, is dried coconut. Right? So these are some of the crops, 22 crops. There are two more crops which also get minimum support price. For example, based on the minimum support price of Copra, the government also announces minimum support price for dehusked coconut. And based on the minimum support price of rapeseed and mustard, the government announces minimum support price for Toria. So these two are additional minimum support prices announced by government of India. So the government officially announces minimum support prices for these 22 plus these two who also derive their MSP from Copra 
and mustard and rapeseed respectively. So total 24. Now, what are the different ways of providing minimum support prices to the farmer? So think about it guys. Suppose I am a farmer. I am using tractor. I am using seeds. These are called inputs. I am using fertilizers. Isn't it? Similarly, this is my family. So my family is also helping me in my agricultural field. If my family would have been working elsewhere, they would have been getting wages, salaries. But now they are working with me in our family agricultural field. So they are not getting any salary, but they have a market value. Similarly, suppose I am using my own money in agriculture. So I don't pay any interest rate. But if I take money from a bank, I have to pay interest rate. So this is my own money. This is my own land. If this was not my own land, I would have taken land on rent, then I have to pay rent. But fortunately, I have a small piece of land, which is my land. So I don't pay rent. This is my money. This is my family. So I don't pay wages to them. I don't pay interest rate to my fund and I don't pay rent to my land. So now how does government of India decide about minimum support prices? Before we get there, let us understand what are the different ways of calculating MSP generally. So there are three ways, typically three ways. So if we add the cost of tractor, seeds, fertilizer, these are inputs. And if we give those costs as minimum support prices, it is called as A2. So the first method of calculation of minimum support prices, take all the inputs, add their cost and provide it to the farmer. That is called A2. The second method is take all the inputs of production, find their cost, add them. Take the value of family labor because if they were working outside, they would have got a wage. Take that wage, imputed value, add it to the cost of inputs. That is called A2 plus FL. FL is family labor. That is also one formula of calculating MSP. The third formula is take all the inputs, add them, take family labor, add it to them, take the interest rate on the funds. These funds belong to the farmer itself. So suppose the farmer would have taken this money from a bank. What interest rate would the farmer have paid? Take that interest rate. If this land would not have, you know, been, been farmer's land, if he would have taken this land on rent, he would have paid a rent, take that rent, add all those things. So inputs plus family labor plus interest rate plus rent, these things. This is called as C2. If you give all these things to the farmer as MSP, it is called C2. So there are three ways. One is A2, second is A2 plus FL, third is C2, three ways. What do we do in, in India? How do we give the MSP to farmers? So in India, you know, what do we do? So in India, suppose the cost of production of food grain by a farmer example is let's say 80 rupees. Suppose the farmer tells the government that my cost of production of a particular crop is 80 rupees. So the government of India says, okay, 80 plus 50% of 80. What is 50% of 80? 40. So 80 plus 50% of 80, 40, 120 rupees is given to the farmer as minimum support prices in India. So what is the minimum support price formula in India? 1.5 times of cost of production. Now let us have a discussion on one of the most important aspects of Indian agriculture called as crop diversification. Why is crop diversification important? Do you guys remember Green Revolution, mid 1960s? Government of India wanted to achieve food security because our production and productivity was not that great. So we started to develop high yielding variety of seeds and we started to promote the cultivation of those high yielding variety of seeds in some specific states of India, for example, Punjab, Haryana and Western UP. What are the crops that we were promoting under Green Revolution's initial phase? Wheat. In fact, some of the experts also call it as wheat revolution in the initial phases because Green Revolution mostly focused on wheat in the initial phase. Now, what is the problem in this method if you are promoting only one, two or three crops? So initially it was wheat, later on it was rice also and some other crops. So if you keep cultivating the same set of crops, one, two or three crops on a particular agricultural field, those crops extract the same nutrients over and again. 
which means your soil will become deficient in a particular nutrient if you keep extracting it. These green revolution states were also using a lot of fertilizers, chemical pesticides, etc., which means the alkalinity of the soil also started to increase. So acidity increased in the soil. These are some of the after effects that happened because of green revolution. So the government of India started to think about something called as crop diversification and rotation so that we can grow different type of crops which will extract different type of nutrients from the soil and not the same nutrients. So let us have a, a, a discussion related to crop diversification. So see, because of green revolution, what happened? Monocropping was promoted in India, which means same set of crops were cultivated. They drew same nutrients. In fact, this point is more dangerous. You know, there are crops which we were promoting since very long, starting from green revolution, like for example, water guzzling crops. So wheat, rice, sugar cane. These are the crops which consume a lot of water. They extract a lot of groundwater. So think about it. If the availability of groundwater in a particular area every year is 100 liters. But if you are extracting 90 liters groundwater or 90 liters water in that area you are using and you are also using let's say 95 liters or 100 liters. So 100 liter is the availability of water and 100 liter is the water that you are extracting and using. So are you putting a lot of stress in that area? Water stress? Yes. So look at the formula of baseline water stress. The baseline water stress means total annual water withdrawal, whatever you are withdrawing, water level, and total available annual renewable supply. So what is the supply every year versus what are you withdrawing? So if supply is 100 liters and you are withdrawing 90 liters or 100 liter itself, there is huge stress, there is huge baseline stress. So if you look at some specific areas of India, for example, look at this guys, look at this area of India, look at the water stress in red color, huge water stress, high, very high, close to 100%. Look at this area, huge water stress. So you would find that water stress is very high in some areas of India where these states are green revolution states and also the states where we follow monocropping same set of crops and water guzzling crop. So if you are promoting those crops which consume a lot of water, there will be huge water stress as you can see. So the government of India has started to change this by promoting crop diversification schemes. Let us have a look into them. So guys, in the year 2013-14, the government of India started a program called as Rashtriya Krishi Vikas Yojana. Under this program, the government of India is promoting crop diversification program whereby the government of India is trying to do a couple of things which are very important. Number one, the government of India is trying to shift area under rice. I told you rice is a water guzzling crop which means it consumes a lot of water. So the government of India is trying to shift area under rice to less water hungry crops like wild seed, pulses and coarse cereals. They consume less water. So the government of India is trying to shift some area from rice to these other crops. There are some states which are very rich in the cultivation of tobacco. For example, Andhra, Bihar, Gujarat, Karnataka, Maharashtra and Odisha. So the government of India from the year 2015-16 has also started to shift area under tobacco to different crops to diversify the crops. One of the important things that the government of India is doing is called as Paramparagat Krishi Vikas Yojana from 2015-16. What is government of India doing under it? Under it, the government of India is trying to promote organic farming. And the government of India has said that if you want to indulge in organic farming, we will support you with inputs. We will also help you financially for processing, packaging and marketing, post-harvest operations. So government of India is helping the farmers who are into organic farming in these two ways. One of the sub-schemes of Paramparagat Krishi Vikas Yojana is Bharatiya Prakritik Krishi Paddhati. It is also called as Natural Farming. What is Natural Farming? So you know the government of India, as I told you, that is very concerned because because of green revolution we used a lot of you know pesticides insecticides chemicals fertilizers and all those things so the government of india is trying to promote a system of farming called as natural farming whereby 
we don't put chemicals we let the soil reclaim its natural fertility we don't use things which destroy the soil fertility if it's a chemical we stay away from it whatever biomass we produce during farming if it is a waste and it is not useful we convert it into something useful through bio recycling these are some of the things that the government of india is trying to do under natural farming they are promoting indigenous practices so guys suppose you are an indian farmer and the land size that you have the plot that you have for cultivation is of very small size how are you going to sustain your family and take care of them you need something to support you in terms of income other than cultivation of crops this is the story of a typical indian farmer you know more than 85% of indian farmers are such that the plot size they have for cultivation the land holding they have is very small less than 2 hectares in size now what they do is they carry on some activities which are related to agriculture to support their families for example they get into cattle rearing livestock dairy fisheries eggs meat production and activities like this all these things are called as allied sector in addition to agriculture which means that if government of india is trying to support the farmers and trying to help them to increase their income or double their income the government has to take care of this specific sector which is helping those farmers whose land size is a small or they don't have land so this sector becomes very crucial for that so let us start our discussion with livestock if you look at the livestock its share in india's total national income is 4.35% which is a decent uh, you know contribution to national income if you look at the contribution of livestock in terms of income generated within agriculture and allied sector we see that over last 5 to 6 years the contribution of livestock within agriculture has increased for example if you look at 2014 15 what was the contribution of livestock in agriculture and allied sector 24% what is their contribution in 2019 20 30% so it has increased over a period of time if you look at the availability of milk meat and eggs in india we see that the availability is also increasing over a period of time which means the production is increasing simple so let's look at the trend of availability of milk see it's going up which means it's increasing similarly if we look at eggs let us look at the production of eggs see it's increasing all right if you look at the meat production of course this is also increasing if you compare this over a long period of time we see an increasing trend so we can safely say that the availability of milk meat and eggs over a period of time has gone up now we come to dairy sector something very interesting about dairy sector is india's rank is first in terms of production of milk so globally india stands at rank 1 you know we provide almost close to 1/4 of world's milk production so if 100 liter milk is produced globally india's contribution is close to 1/4 which is 23% how many indian farmers typically depend upon dairy sector for their livelihood close to 8 crore farmers and you know there is something very interesting about india if you look at the number of farmers and the farming families which depend upon dairy and things like fisheries if you add dairy and fishery close to 8 crores here and almost more than 2 crores in fisheries so almost 10 to 11 crore crore farmers depend upon dairy and fisheries that is the importance of these allied sector in agriculture if we look carefully at the production of milk in india let's see the trend is increasing which means over a period of time from 2014 15 to 2020 21 the production of milk has been going up there is one interesting figure which has been given in the economic survey if you look carefully we will find that the the different states of india have a different scenario of milk production and milk availability let's look at some interesting things so let's let's see let's start with up so in up we would find that the production of milk is this whereas availability of milk is this 
if we if we compare it with punjab for example let's say let's look at punjab air so the production of milk is is of this level but the availability of milk is this which means that there are states where production of milk is not very high relatively low but the availability of milk is high which means people have a taste for dairy products and milk this clearly is reflected in this diagram so for example if you look at telangana and jammu kashmir look at the production of milk but look at the availability why would milk be available because there is a demand people have a taste for it right so from this diagram we know that there is a difference in production and availability of milk across india now if we come to egg and meat sector let us look at the rank of india in terms of production of eggs and production of meat so india's global rank in terms of production of egg is rank 3rd in terms of meat it is rank 8th and as we already discussed that the trend of production of meat milk and eggs in india is increasing that is what we have written here if we talk about fisheries india's global rank is rank 2nd in terms of fish production and you know india produces almost 8% of global fish production this is the contribution of india now if we talk about the contribution of fisheries in india's national income it's almost 1.24% and this can be increased that is what the government of india wants and if you look at the contribution of fisheries in india's agriculture we see it's 8% which is very decent by the way contribution of fisheries in agriculture is 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 getting close to 10% which is a very good achievement if you look at the contribution of fisheries in employment in india as i told you some time back it's close to 3 crores so 8 crore farmers in livestock you know and 3 crore farmers in fisheries it's it's a good number almost 10 to 11 crore farmers easily depend upon livestock and fisheries now if we come to different schemes by government of india and initiative by government of india in the field of animal husbandry allied activities we would find something very interesting we would find that the government is taking care of those small nitty gritties which would help this allied sector to grow for example let's see there is a program called as national animal disease control program this was started by the government of india under atmanirbhar bharat you know this is world's largest vaccination drive if you consider both human and animals this is the largest vaccination drive across the world and the government of india plans that by 2030 they want to remove two problems which are affecting the livestock in india and animal rearing in india first is foot and mouth disease and second is brucellosis and these two have to be removed by 2030 that's the target of government of india so they have started this drive now if you look at something very interesting which was started under atmanirbhar bharat package that is called as animal husbandry infrastructure development fund very very crucial so what is happening there i'll give you an example So suppose guys somebody wants to get into dairy and meat processing and somebody wants to get into the business of animal feed animal feed means food for animals and suppose somebody wants to convert milk into curd milk into butter or 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 you know meat processing industry because these are very lucrative industry it creates a lot of employment so if you want to do this you need capital who would be the people who would be interested in this maybe a group of farmers as i taught you group of farmers for example would be called as farmer producer organization or maybe a small industrialist like msme or maybe a private entrepreneur a private businessman they want to get into the field of processing of meat processing of milk or maybe creation of animal feed they want to make an investment but suppose they they run short of money they don't have money maybe because of covid scenario economic slowdown but they have the acumen they have the skill to do it what shall they do so the government of india has started this program whereby they have announced 15000 crore rupees package under atmanirbhar bharat starting from 2020 what is done there so for example an fpo msme or private firm if they want a loan for example let's say that they need a loan of 100 crore rupees example just to take an example 100 crore so they can come to a bank and they can ask the bank that what is your interest rate so bank will say 
एट परसेंट इंटरेस्ट रेट बट इफ दे टेक लोन स्पेसिफिकली फॉर दिस डेरी मीट प्रोसेसिंग एंड एनिमल फीड अंडर दिस प्रोग्राम दिस बैंक विल गिव दैम अ डिस्काउंट ऑफ थ्री परसेंट सो इफेक्टिव रेट ऑफ इंटरेस्ट फॉर दैम वुड बी फाइव परसेंट ओनली बट यू ऑल्सो नो समथिंग इफ यू टेक अ बैंक लोन यू हैव टू गिव अ बैंक गारंटी और को लैटरल सो इन दिस केस इफ यू आर टेकिंग हंड्रेड क्रोर टेन लैक्स और फाइव लैक्स और वट एवर मनी यू हैव टू गिव बैंक गारंटी राइट हु विल प्रोवाइड बैंक गारंटी बिकॉज इफ दीज यू नो एफ पी ओज एम एस एम ईज एंड प्राइवेट फॉर्म वुड हैव गॉट मनी इन देयर पैकेट पॉकेट वाई वुड दे कम टू बैंक टू टेक लोन्स सो द गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया इज सेंग दैट बिकॉज इट्स अ कोविड सिनारियो अंडर आत्मनिर्भर भारत पैकेज दे हैव अनाउंस दिस सो द गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया इज सेंग वट एवर लोन यू रिक्वायर अप टू ट्वेंटी फाइव परसेंट ऑफ योर टोटल लोन दैट यू टेक गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया वुड प्रोवाइड दिस क्रेडिट गारंटी फॉर रेस्ट ऑफ द थिंग यू हैव टू टेक केयर बट अप टू ट्वेंटी फोर परसेंट ट्वेंटी फाइव परसेंट फंड दैट यू आर टेकिंग गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया विल प्रोवाइड द क्रेडिट गारंटी प्लस यू आर गेटिंग इंटरेस्ट सबवेंशन ऑफ थ्री परसेंट विच मीन्स डिस्काउंट ऑन द इंटरेस्ट रेट और सब्सिडी ऑन द इंटरेस्ट रेट दिस इज to be done under a program called as animal husbandry infrastructure development fund so this fund has been created now you know earlier the kisan credit card was only meant for a normal farming community not for allied activities like fish etc but around the year 2018 19 government of india realized that you know farmers who are engaged in fisheries they also need fund for their operational activities for example they also need fund to buy fuel labor charge because they go in boats then they go for fishing etc right so they also need fund so the government of india allowed these farmers who are in the you know fishing business to use kisan credit card to avail basic funds and what is the limit for these fisheries up to 2 lakh rupees that is what they can take Now, if you look at one more program by government of India, it's a very ambitious program. It is called as Pradhan Mantri Matsya Sampada Yojana 2020. This has already been started under Atmanirbhar Bharat package. You know what government is doing under it? Under this program, the government of India is planning to improve the production and productivity of fish rearing, fish cultivation in India. What are they trying to do there? See, guys, fish. Whenever you do fish rearing, so fish is is very perishable in nature. so is any kind of animal product so you need very good cold storage good infrastructure good transportation facilities etc you need very good technology to catch the fish to process the fish so the government of india is saying they will provide good infrastructure post harvest which means when you have caught the fish you have to store it transport it distribute these are the kind plus regulatory framework so if somebody wants to get into the business of fisheries the government of india is going to provide you easy without headache and stress free clearances all right now new technology to catch the fish these are the things that the government is going to do under pradhan mantri matsya sampada yojana plus suppose you are very good in fish rearing you you are one of the best in the world of course you would like to export your product so government of india is going to help the the fishing farmers in exporting the products as well if you look at the last part this is very crucial because you know government somehow has to bring private sector so that private sector can also bring new technology new ideas funds and they can also become partners with the fishing community so that they can prosper in a fast paced manner so the government of india wants to increase private participation in fisheries so that the contribution of fisheries in india's national income and agricultural income can also increase now this is one of the very interesting uh, you know schemes by government of india which is mentioned in the economic survey i'll give you an example from real life you know few years back i traveled to vijayawada when i traveled there i got to know that you know if you go to the main city of vijayawada very close to that there is a rural area i traveled there few few kilometers away towards the east when i reached there i i saw that there are huge agricultural fields but i couldn't see any crops there i just saw palm trees and i saw some vegetables and small you know plants being planted between the palm trees i started to wonder that why i am not finding any crop rice wheat etc etc there so i asked the local community about what is going on so they told me that earlier they were cultivating a lot of crops then they got to know 
that if they change their agricultural pattern, they can earn more income. And I got to know something very interesting. You know what farmers did? They stopped crop cultivation. They converted their plot of land into fish rearing ground. And on the edges of their plot, they planted palm tree and small vegetable, etc. So what they're doing is exactly this. This is a plot. Earlier there was cultivation of crops, now there is no cultivation, they filled it with water. And now they are doing fish rearing inside it and on the border of it, they are growing, you know, palm trees, papaya, etc, etc and some small vegetables. Now, now, how are they carrying this activity out? So what they are doing is, whatever is the waste product of these plants on the embankments or the side of the plot, those products are used as feed or food for the fish. So on one side you are growing palm, papaya and small vegetables. You are using that, their byproduct as a food for fishes. So you are getting fishes also. And on the side of it, you are doing basic food, you know, fish processing and vegetable processing, basic. This is called as integrated farming. So why is integrated farming important? Because suppose I have a very small plot of land, my cultivation will not be able to support me. Crop cultivation will not support my family. I'm a small farmer. Maybe I'm, I'm having a very small piece of land or maybe I'm a landless farmer. This can save me because there are three things happening. One, I'm getting normal crops and vegetable on the side. I'm getting fish here and I can get good prices. And if I can do basic processing, their life can be increased. So see what is happening there. Crops and, and the wastage of crop is used as food for fish, basic processing. This is integrated farming. So the government of India is promoting integrated farming a lot and within integrated farming there is a new scheme which the government of India mentions in the survey. It's called as sweet revolution or sweet kranti. What is government doing there? So there is a program called as national beekeeping and honey mission which was started under Atmanirbhar Bharat by government of India in the year 2020-2021 and it will last up to 2022-23 this year. Government has allocated 500 crore rupees under it and the government of India is trying to promote, you know, honey, uh, you know, export out of India and, and availability of honey within the country as well. Because we have observed that over last few years, if you look carefully over the last few years between 2013, 14 and 1920, you know, the export of honey from India increased by 110%. That is the prospect. So the government thought, why not promote honey cultivation in the landless laborer community as well as farming community? Because this can help to increase their income. It can supplement their income in agriculture. All right. Now we get into something very interesting called as food processing industries. So food processing industry is called as sunrise industry. Guys, what is a sunrise industry? An industry which is growing in nature which is achieving something, but it has not yet reached its full potential is called as a sunrise industry. So government of India is paying a lot of attention to sunrise industry like food processing industry because it directly uses agricultural products as its raw material and it adds value to it. For example, it will take milk from the agriculture sector, convert it into cheese and butter and they are of high value. We can use it within India, we can export it also. So we can get export income, farmers income increases, people get employment here because it is labor intensive. So it's, it's a very, very crucial industry for India. And how do you know it's a very crucial industry? Look at its contribution and we will get to know. So if we see, we find that in five years between 2015 to 2019, in these five, six years, the average rate of growth of this food processing industry is 11.1%, double digit rate of growth. If you look at their share in manufacturing income, in the manufacturing sector, the share of food processing industry is close to 10%, which is 9.87%, again double digit, close to 10%. So the government of India recently has taken a lot of reforms in the food processing industry. What are those reforms? For example, the first is Pradhan Mantri formalization of micro food processing enterprises, which is between 2020 to 2025. This was announced under Atmanirbhar Bharat package. The second important scheme is Pradhan Mantri Kisan Sampada Yojana between 2016 to 2020. This was one of the very important schemes. 
and third is operation greens or top top means tomatoes onion and potatoes 2018 and 19 is the time when it started let's have a brief overview of all these three schemes let's start with you know pradhan mantri formalization of micro food processing enterprises you know what is what is micro food processing enterprises they are very small processing centers for example if you go to you know bihar what do you to find there is something very interesting called as makhanas or fox nuts so they are, they are very rich in calcium and they are very easy and light on the body and very nutritious so so these farmers who are into makhana cultivation they take the makhanas and they convert it into processed makhana something of high value uh, you know in these small processing centers which is as at the village level and then they sell it at a decent price there are many such products across india if you travel in any district of india you will find there is something unique india is full of unique products so the government of india is saying that the government will go to different districts of india and they will pick up a unique product there and they will provide all kinds of support if anybody wants to get into the processing of those unique products support like for example government of india will give capital grants which means financial support maximum up to 10 lakh rupees the government will also help these micro food processing enterprises the small food processing centers in marketing branding in storage in packaging so the government of india has created this nice program called as formalization of micro food processing enterprises see this is how the program looks like so the government of india allocated 10000 crore rupees under atmanirbhar bharat for the program and government plans to cover 2 lakh micro food processing industries farmer producer organizations and cooperatives these are the three entities who are going to he get help under the program so under the program there are two components one is one district one product so in every district government of india is going to go and find out if there is a unique product so far the government has found out 137 unique products in 710 districts of india in 35 states and union territories and government of india is providing marketing branding storage and supply chain packaging for these products and who is helping these products to be marketed the agencies by government of india called nafed and trifed they are helping in the marketing upsc can ask you questions that which agencies are helping in the marketing of these products so nafed and trifed government of india is also giving capital grants as i said example suppose for a particular food processing industry you require 50 lakh rupees this is an example government of india said that under this program they are going to give 35% capital subsidy which means 17.5 lakh rupees so 35% of 50 lakhs is 17.5 lakh so government said whatever is lower between 35% and 10 lakh that will be given so maximum 10 lakh can be given not beyond that so if 35% is 17.5 lakhs but 10 lakhs is the maximum so 10 lakhs will be given to you as a capital grant let the rest you have to arrange the government has also promised a seed fund seed fund means money that you require in the beginning initial stages so seed fund of 40000 rupees will also be provided and the government of india has designated union bank of india as the nodal bank and 11 other banks have been given the status of lending partners so if anyone wants financial help loan etc under the scheme you can approach these lending partners and which is the nodal bank which is taking care of the financial part union bank of india so this is a very important scheme under atmanirbhar bharat the second scheme which we are going to look into is pm kisan sampada yojana what is this and why was there a need for it i'll tell you the need for it you know in india there have been so many schemes related to food processing industry for example mega food park scheme started in the year 2008 then scheme related to cold chain infrastructure the agri sport zones there are so many schemes which were started 10 15 years back there are many new schemes which the government of india has started recently so the government of india thought why not streamline those schemes and divide all the schemes related to food processing industries into two parts so what the government did is government said let us start an umbrella scheme called pradhan mantri kisan sampada yojana so this is the umbrella scheme sampada yojana 
So what the government did under it is they took all the schemes related to food processing industry which were old schemes and the government merged all the old schemes and put it under Sampada Yojana. So these are the old schemes like Mega Food Park, Cold Chain etc. They were merged, old schemes were merged under Sampada Yojana. Then the government said that the second pillar of Sampada Yojana would involve all the new schemes related to food processing industry. For example, Operation Green. This is a new scheme started in 2018. So that came under the new pillar. So new scheme. When you combine both of these, it is called as Sampada Yojana. All right. Now let's come to the third scheme, Operation Green, which we just talked about. So you know, what was the need of Operation Green? There is some, something very unique about India. If you look at tomatoes, onion and potatoes, there are many other crops, but the government started with tomatoes, onion and potatoes. You know what we find in India? Suppose this is map of India. All right. If you come to the east side of India, it's very good in vegetables and fruits. So for example, let's say that fruits and vegetables are produced in surplus quantity in the east of India, northeast of India. When something is produced in surplus, you know what is the price of that? So the prices will be low. So farmers will get low prices here. Why? Because it is produced in surplus. So prices are low and quantity is high, which means availability is very high. If you go to west of India, you will see that the fruits and vegetable availability here because production is not that great here. So availability means quantity is low and the price is very high. This side surplus, this side deficit. So the government of India said that we will promote the transportation of surplus produce from this side to this side. And the government said that for transportation and storage of tomatoes, onion and potatoes, this program started in the year 2018. Government said for transportation of tomatoes, onion and potatoes, the government will give 50% subsidy to the farmers and for storage also 50% subsidy. So a farmer can trans store and transport these crops to other parts of India. They will get 50% subsidy. This scheme was initially covering tomatoes, onion and potatoes only. So for example, if you look at the tomato producing areas of India, Gujarat, Karnataka, Andhra, Odisha. These are the tomatoes producing areas. Similarly, we have a potato belt of India starting from Gujarat to Madhya Pradesh to, you know, Bihar, Bengal region, etc. So the government of India selected some states and launched the program. But under Atmanirbhar Bharat, the government expanded it and converted the top. Top means tomatoes, onion and potatoes. Only these crops were covered under the scheme. The government of India expanded it under Atmanirbhar Bharat to total. Total means the government of India was trying to cover all fruits and vegetables under this program. And the last, last notification by government of India said that the scheme top has been converted into total till 31st December 2021. So for the year 2022, we are still awaiting the details by government of India whether they are following total or whether they are following Operation Green which is top. This is called as Operation green. So guys, now let us have a look into the food management of India. You know, it assumes a lot of significance for a country which is developing in nature and where a majority of the population depends upon agriculture or rural sector. So let us have an overview. You see, before we get into the details of food management in India, it would be great to have an overview of how the food management system works in India. Now see, this is government of India and we have farmers. Before the farmers actually start sowing their crops, the government of India makes an announcement and says that government of India is going to provide an assured price for a selected crops. For example, government of India would make announcement typically for 22 crops and the government says we are going to give assured prices to the farmers even before the sowing has started. Now this is done by government of India to make sure that the farmers get at least a remunerative price, a decent price for their crops. Because you know what happens whenever farmer produces the crop, if there is bumper production, there is a very high chance that there might be a distress sale and the farmers might suffer huge losses. If you Google, you will find it out that, you know, typically whenever our production is very high in the economy, 
So, so many a times the price of rice, wheat, tomatoes, onion, potatoes, if the government does not help the farmers, then the price hits even 1 rupee a kg, 50 paisa a kg, 2 rupees a kg and the farmers simply dump their crops. To prevent situations like this, so that farmers don't have to throw their crops, the government of India announces minimum support prices. Once the minimum support prices are announced, now the farmers make a decision whether to cultivate those crops or not. If the farmer feels that it is beneficial, they cultivate the crops. And mostly, the farmers cultivate those crops in huge amounts where minimum support prices are given. Once the crops are ready, now Food Corporation of India comes and buys those crops from the farmers at minimum support prices. Then Food Corporation of India takes it in its go-downs. In the go-downs, the Food Corporation of India keeps aside a certain quantity of crop called as buffer stock. Why? Because we need to have something extra in the economy just in case the situation demands us to have some kind of buffer or some kind of emergency situation. So for that, buffer stock is maintained. Now the Food Corporation of India starts to release food grains to state governments. Why? Because state governments have to take care of the citizens through National Food Security Act and other welfare schemes. So this is how the Food Corporation of India transfers the food grains to state governments. The price at which the Food Corporation of India transfers the food grains to state government is called as central issue price. Now typically what happens is, suppose the minimum support price offered to the farmer, let's say, is, is 30 rupees for the crops. Now, Food Corporation of India also has to incur charges for transportation, for storage, labor cost, etc., etc. So, so, you know, whatever cost the Food Corporation of in India and the government of India bear to take the crops from farmers, store it, maintain it, so that is called as economic cost of food grains. So for example, MSP is 30 rupees, storage, transportation, labor cost and everything. So including everything, suppose 60 rupees is the economic cost. This is the cost which government of India bears to take crops from the farmers and then store it. Now when the government asks the Food Corporation of India to release the crop, these crops are released at a price called as central issue price which is lower than the economic cost. So, for example, central issue price is 60, uh, uh, so, so the economic cost is 60 and suppose that central issue price is, let's say, 20, only 20, 20 rupees. So, the cost that the government of India bears is 60, but the price that the government charges from the state government is 20. So, what is the difference? 60 minus 20. This is economic cost and this is central issue price. The difference is 40 rupees and this 40 rupees is the food subsidy that the government of India provides. This is how the system of food management works in India. So, now let us have a look at the details of the food management. Let's see. So, what are the objectives of food management in Indian economy? So, there are basically three objectives which the government keeps in mind. Number one, when the government talks about food management, they want to make sure that the farmers get a decent price for their crops. That is what we have written here. And who makes sure that they procure the crops from farmer and pay decent prices to them? So, the nodal agencies, Food Corporation of India. Once the crops have been taken, from the farmers. Now the government wants to make sure that the food distribution is good. Consumers get the food products at decent prices. So distribution aspect is the second important aspect of food management in India. In the distribution, the focus of the government is vulnerable section of the society and poor section of the society. That is being taken care through National Food Security Act. What is National Food Security Act? National Food Security Act came into existence into force from 2013. Under this, Government of India provides food grains to its citizen who need government help. Basically, citizens who are poor and who are very poor. So under this National Food Security Act, if you are extremely poor, under Antyodaya Anna Yojana, 
which is a part of National Food Security Act, 35 kilogram you know, cereals, food grains are provided to each family every month. Now, if you are a poor family, you will get rice, wheat and cereals, which is 5 kilograms per person per month under National Food Security Act. The price that you have to pay if you are poor is 3 rupees for rice, 2 rupees for wheat and 1 rupee for coarse cereals per kilogram. But if you are extremely poor, then you will not have to pay that price. You will get 35 kilogram of food per household per month. Right? This is what is done in National Food Security Act. Once these two things are taken care of, procurement and distribution, Government of India also makes sure that they keep something as buffer, buffer stock. Why? Because for some emergency situation or, you know, to maintain prices, etc. So whenever there is a scarcity in the economy and if you have some buffer, you can release the food grain. So buffer stock is also maintained. Now let us have a look at some of the important schemes by Government of India in the field of food management and agriculture. You know when COVID hit the Indian economy, the Government of India realized that there are people who have lost their jobs. They are not in a position even to pay 3 rupees, 4 rupees a kg. How would they eat? How would they live? So the Government of India launched a program called as Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan Yojana. Under it, in addition to National Food Security Act, see National Food Security Act was not dismantled, it continues. It's a very important act, it still continues. Along with it, the government of India ran Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan Yojana where 5 kilograms food grains were given free of cost to 80 crore National Food Security Act household. So how many citizens of India are getting the benefits of National Food Security Act? Almost 80, 81 crore people. Everyone or anyone who is getting the benefit of National Food Security Act was given 5 kilogram free food by government of India under Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan Yojana. You know, India is a country where if you, if you look at the medical history of, of women in India, you will find that largely they are anemic. Anemia is a big problem. Similarly, there is a deficiency of vitamin, there is a deficiency of other nutrients in human body if you talk about a country like India. We are a developing economy. So the government of India has started a program which is called as fortification. Under fortification, the government of India adds things like iron, folic acid and vitamin in our food grains and then distributes it to public so that along with food, we are also getting nutrients. Then the government of India also launched a program called as One Nation, One Ration Card. This is a very interesting one. So for example, if you look at the ration card system, so for example, let's say I am staying in a particular district in my state. So my local government would make a ration card for me. I would take that ration card and go to the ration shop in my locality and buy my food grains or get my food grains. Suppose I am a poor person and I am traveling to other state for work. So I migrate to other state and you know, there are majority of people in rural areas who don't have land. They don't have huge land or they are landless. So what they do is they migrate to cities and towns for work. When they migrate there, that ration card did not, you know, become beneficial for them because they could not use it. So the government of India said, why not create a system whereby if you have a ration card belonging to one locality, you can even use it in different states of India so that you do not have to sleep hungry. So if I am a labor, I am a worker who is working, for example, in Delhi and I belong to, let's say, a village in Madhya Pradesh, I can come to Delhi, I can use the ration card, I can take food grains and I can survive. So that is the beauty of this scheme. It's very good for migrants. Then there is a scheme called as Open Market Sales, Open Market Sales Scheme, OMSS. So, you know, if you remember when we were discussing this, you know, sometimes what happens is when the Food Corporation of India procures the food grain from farmers, they store it here. They release some of the food grains to state governments for these National Food Security Act and welfare schemes based on the requirement. They also keep buffer. But after doing all these things also, since India produces a lot of food grains, there are food grains which are kept with Food Corporation of India in its go down and they keep having it year after year. 
So there are times when there is surplus food grains with Food Corporation of India. And why is there a surplus food grain? I'll give you an example. Suppose the government of India announced that they are going to give a very good price for wheat this year. MSP, minimum support price for wheat would be very high. So what do the farmers do? They start to cultivate wheat. There is bumper production of wheat. When the government says that they will procure wheat using MSP, whatever crops the farmers offer to the government in whatever quantity. So whatever quantity of wheat the farmer is offering to Food Corporation of India, FCI has to procure it because they promise to the farmers that under MSP they will procure whatever quantity is offered to them. So what happens? Because of bumper production, there is huge pile up of food grains here, extra food grains. So either they rot or sometimes what the Food Corporation of India does is instead of wasting it, they sell it at a predetermined price in the open market under a scheme called as open market sales scheme. The price at which they sell it in the open market sales schemes is called as reserve price. So now guys, let us go back to the food subsidy which we were talking about a few moments earlier. You remember I told you that the government of India asks the food corporation of India to procure the food grains from farmers at MSP. So basically we are going to look at what is the cost, economic cost of food grains that the government of India procures and stores. So the government of India through food corporation of India pays MSP, labor, transportation, storage charges and distribution charges. All these things for example can be called as economic cost. This cost the government has to bear. I gave you an example that suppose this cost is 60 rupees. Now Food Corporation of India holds the food grain. This is food grains. And then they release the food grains to the state government for National Food Security Act and other welfare measures. So the price at which the Food Corporation of India releases the food grains is called as central issue price. Suppose the central issue price is 20 rupees. So what is the you know, subsidy, food subsidy given by government of India, the food subsidy, for example, in this case is 60 minus 20, 40. You know what has been observed in India? It has been observed in India that over a period of time, the economic cost has been going up and the government of India has not changed central issue price. They have kept it more or less in the same range, which means that the food subsidy has been increasing. Government of India wanted to control it. So since past few years, the government started to take action and the government started to make policies so as to reduce the economic cost. So guys, if the economic cost reduces from 60 to 50 and if the central issue price is increased a little bit, then see what will be the food subsidy 20 from 40, it will become 20. So the government of India these days is working upon a plan so that the government of India can control food subsidy. And how does the government want to control food subsidy? The government says that one of the ways would be to reduce economic cost and increase central issue price. See, redu reduce economic cost, increase central issue price so that food subsidy can be controlled. So now we are going to look into ethanol blended petrol. So now guys, let us have a look into the trend in food subsidy in India. You see, if you look at the food subsidy and growth in food subsidy, we would observe that around COVID, there is a huge jump in the food subsidy provided by government of India, which is almost 398.7% growth. Now we come to something interesting, which is called as ethanol blended with petrol. So see, you know that petrol is a, is a very premium commodity these days. It's very costly. And especially in the context of Russia, Ukraine war also, things have not been very stable in the international market. India imports a lot of petroleum, right? So, so our import bill is very high. Government of India wants to control it. So one of the ways to control it is to mix ethanol in petrol and then sell it as commercial fuel. So what are we doing? You know, if you, if you look at how we are manufacturing ethanol, you will see that currently we are using sugar, we are using damaged grains and surplus grains. Remember with Food Corporation of India, we have damaged and surplus grains. Then we are using cane juice, sugar syrup and molasses. What are molasses? So if you ever try to visit or get an opportunity to visit a sugar mill, you will see that from sugar cane, when they extract the sugar, sugar syrup, 
whatever is the byproduct, whatever is left is called as molasses. Now that molasses is, is used to, to get ethanol. That molasses are also used to get some fertilizer which we will talk about very soon. So, so these are the things which are currently being used to get ethanol. So from these ethanol is produced. Uh, similarly from sugarcane, maize and wheat, all these things are giving ethanol. Now this ethanol is mixed with fossil fuel like petrol and then we get commercial fuel. So what has been the timeline that the government of India is following? So it all started in 2001 as an experiment on a pilot basis where 5% ethanol was mixed with petrol. Now in the year 2005, this was ethanol blended petrol, same 5% we continued. In the year 2022, the target is to blend 10% ethanol in petrol. And, and by the year 2025, the target is that we will blend 20% ethanol in petrol. It would be called as E20, 20% ethanol blended in petrol. So now guys, let us get into something very, very crucial for Indian agriculture, which is called as fertilizers. Now, can you take a guess? What are some of the very, very crucial nutrients which are required for soil and plants? Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium and sulfur. In addition to it, there are other nutrients which are also required. For example, zinc that is also required. So, you know, Government of India has created a fertilizer policy where the Government of India gives a particular subsidy for fertilizers based upon nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium and sulphur. And if you talk about other nutrients, for example, zinc and bronze based fertilizers, then the Government of India has a separate subsidy scheme for them. So there are two different subsidy rates and ways in which the government of India gives subsidy. One is a fixed subsidy rate for nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium and sulphur based fertilizers. And if you are talking about fertilizers based upon bronze and zinc, then there is a separate subsidy which is given. But this is not the important question. The important question which we miss out is how are subsidies provided in the field of fertilizers in India. So see, this is how it is done. So, so I have tried to create a very small layman kind of sketch so that we get a good idea about it. So see, for example, you know, the, the most important thing to note here is subsidies in fertilizers in India are not given on the basis of production, but subsidies in India on fertilizers are given based on the value of actual sales. So let us see how it goes. So see, this is a farmer. So, so here you have a farmer. The farmer has a Kisan credit card or Aadhaar. Whatever the farmer wants to bring, farmer can bring either. Now, this is a fertilizer plant or factory. Here, fertilizer is being manufactured. So, let us talk about fertilizer based on nitrogen. Let's say urea. Let's see how that system works in India. So, if a factory is manufacturing urea as a fertilizer, suppose the factory says that the price is 100 rupees, all right, including everything, 100 rupees. The government of India comes and tells the factory that no, we will fix a price for urea. The price would be, for example, 60. So this fertilizer plant will have to sell the fertilizers to farmers at 60 rupees MRP. How will the farmer buy the fertilizer? The farmer using his you know, Kisan credit card or Aadhaar card would come to a retail store to buy the fertilizer. And here there are POS machines. The farmer would use KCC, Kisan credit card or Aadhaar card and then farmer would purchase the fertilizer at MRP of 60 rupees for example. This information related to the farmer and what quantity of fertilizer the farmer produced is registered here in this retail. That information is then passed on to e Urvarak DBT platform, direct benefit transfer platform. So this platform, e Urvarak DBT platform, it stores the information related to farmers, Aadhaar number or KCC and how much quantity the farmer bought. This information is given to government of India. Now since the actual sale has happened, the government then transfers. See what is the difference? The fertilizer plant was saying 100 rupees. Government fixed the rate at 60. 40 rupees is the difference. So this 40 rupees is transferred by government of India to the fertilizer manufacturer. This is how fertilizer subsidy is given for urea. 
सपोज वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट फर्टिलाइजर सब्सिडी अदर देन यूरिया फॉर एग्जाम्पल पोटेशियम एंड फॉस्फोरस हाउ इज दैट सब्सिडी गिवेन सो फॉर एग्जाम्पल लेट से फैक्ट्री सेज दैट वी आर मैन्युफैक्चरिंग फर्टिलाइजर बेस्ड ऑन फॉस्फोरस एंड पोटेशियम द प्राइस इज हंड्रेड रुपीज द गवर्नमेंट हैज डी कंट्रोल रेट नॉ द गवर्नमेंट सेज यू कैन कीप अ प्राइस फॉर फॉस्फोरस एंड पोटेशियम फर्टिलाइजर एट रिटेल लेवल सपोज दे कीप अ प्राइस एट सेवेंटी रुपीज The farmers will pay a price of seventy. Information goes to government of India. Government of India will transfer thirty rupees to these factories. This is how it goes. So now, guys, let us have a look into the fertilizer subsidy and its trend in India. You see, if you look at the fertilizer subsidy, one point which we must note here is is the amount of subsidy that we provide to urea-based fertilizer. See. the fertilizer subsidy for urea is this this much this much so look at the increasing trend 47 49.4 these are in 1000 crores 57.1 99.5 thousand crores isn't it and then in the post covid phase 2021 22 it came down but if you if you remove this post covid phase if you look at it see look at the urea subsidy its trend is going up up and up in fact the other subsidies phosphorus and potassium is also not coming down it is also showing an increasing trend but urea is being consumed heavily in india this shows the trend in subsidy and consumption of urea now you know india imports a lot of fertilizer if you look at the import figure for fertilizers it's huge see we depend upon imports to fulfill our requirements for fertilizer look at the urea you see look at the amount of urea that we are importing you know import of fertilizer 54.8 59 look at it how it is increasing now it came down in the post covid phase so if you keep this aside for some time look at the trend this is the long term trend isn't it now if you look at the phosphorus and other fertilizers also see look at the trend so we have been importing a lot of fertilizers which is something which the government is worried so the government has taken some steps to reduce our dependence on import of fertilizers see what are the steps taken by government of india to control the import of fertilizer first is to promote indigenous production so government of india has started new urea policy in 2015 because we have been importing a lot of urea and we have been using a lot of urea so indigenous production which means we will pr produce more urea within our country and number 2 rationalize subsidy if you if you if you create a subsidy system which does not give unnecessary incentives to use something that would be a good policy for fertilizer based subsidy now government of india has also started to promote something called as neem coated urea you know if you take urea and put a layer of neem over it and then apply it to plants there are many advantages for example the moment you coat neem scientifically it has been proven that the release of urea because a layer of neem is over the urea so release of urea in the plant becomes little slow it is slowed down and when it is slowed down plants are able to absorb the urea more efficiently in fact their productivity goes up and also you know neem is a natural insecticide so it helps in keeping away the unnecessary insects etc away from the plants also so a lot of benefit of neem coated urea now you remember i told you that if you get a chance to visit sugar factory or sugar mill you will see after we extract sugar from sugar cane whatever is left over the by product is called molasses we use molasses to manufacture ethanol right the molasses are also a rich source of potash so you know if a fertilizer based if 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 for example a sugar mill is using the molasses to manufacture fertilizer which is potash related fertilizer the government of india would also bring them under subsidy scheme which is which we just studied called as nutrients based subsidy scheme so if anyone is using molasses to extract potash and then use it as fertilizer the government of india will incorporate them in our fertilizer based subsidy scheme why why is the government doing all these things the government is doing all these things because ultimately we want to reduce our dependence on imports of fertilizers so having seen different facets of indian agriculture now we come to a point where we need to talk about future prospects and how policies should be framed in the field of indian agriculture but guys tell me one thing 
is it possible to create a suitable policy if we don't have the right facts in our hand? How are we going to analyze? How are we going to create policies? So one very interesting thing which has been given in this year's economic survey is something related to the crucial facts and trends in Indian agriculture. Let us have a look into it before we get into the future prospects and how to create policies for Indian agriculture. See, there is this interesting thing given in the economic survey called as Situation Assessment Survey 2021. This Situation Assessment Survey has been conducted by National Statistical Office in its 77th round. The title of this Situation Assessment Survey is Land and Livestock Holdings of Households and Situation Assessment of Agriculture Households. So what is basically written in this report called as Situation Assessment Survey? Three things are given. Number one, what is the status of income in the field of agriculture? So what is the income level in the field of Indian agriculture? Number two, what are the sources of those income? So for example, currently, how much income is generated by the farmers? What is the source of their income? How are the farmers getting their income? Whether through cultivation of crops, through animals, etc. So that is given. And third, overall socio-economic aspects of Indian agriculture is also discussed here. So guys, before we get into anything related to policy formulation, don't you think that we should know what is the income level, what are the sources and what is the socio-economic condition in the field of agriculture? Some very interesting facts have come out of this survey. So let us see. So, so we are going to look at three, four different facts which have come out of this survey. Number one, if we look at the average monthly income of agricultural households, over a period of time, it has increased. For example, in the year 2014, the average monthly income per agricultural household was 6,426, roughly 6,500 rupees. It has increased to 10,200 rupees in 2021. So there has been an increase in the average monthly income per agricultural household. We must remember this. When we talk about the sources of income, so how, how is the agriculture household getting this income what is the source of this income so we can broadly divide these sources into five different types for example so so the income earned through wage when you work somewhere when you work in the agricultural field of others obviously it is your it is a wage that you are getting similarly farming of animals so things related to animal husbandry non-farm business so these are not typically cultivation of crop, but related activities. For example, you know, a basic household kind of very small industry, which is related to agriculture, but not directly cropping. Land leasing, when you give away your land to somebody for cultivation and then crop income, it is cultivation of crops. So if we compare the trend in 2014 and 2021, we see something very interesting. Let's, let's have an analysis of this fact. So in the year 2014, the contribution of, you know, wage income in the total agricultural income was 32%. So for farmers, wage income was very, very important. 32% of their income was wage income. Farming of animals contributed 12% in their income, income of the farmers. Non-farm business 8%, land leasing, data not available, and crop income 48, which means almost 50% of the income of the farmers, it came from cultivation of crops. See, very, very crucial. Now let's come to 2021. Here we see that the contribution of wage income has increased, which means more farmers are working after getting wages. Now if you are working for wages, what do you conclude from that? That are you having a big piece of land? No. If you have huge holding of land, why would you work for wage? You would give it to somebody else on lease. Right? So, wage income's share has increased. Farming of animal, its share has increased. Non-farm business, its share has come down. Land leasing, 1%. New entry. And crop income has come down. Why would crop income come down? So, if I don't have big agricultural field, I cannot implement modern methods of production. So my crop income will come down, my other incomes will go up. So crop income has come down, other incomes have gone up. 
but still crop income is 37 percent which is decent so what what emerges from this from this we can see that crop income is one of the major sources of income for the farmers but there is a definite diversification of income sources so diversification is being observed here see Farming of animal 12 to 16 percent. Definitely there is diversification. Wage income is increasing. So diversification. So now let's look at other aspects of the report. This one is very, very interesting. You know, this part tells us that what are the sources of monthly income class wise. So, you know, in India, the farmers hold different size of land. There are some farmers who are called as small and marginal farmers. They hold less than two hectares of land. Then there are farmers who are medium farmers, 2 to 10 hectares of land. Then there are farmers who are big farmers, greater than 10 hectares of land. So if we look carefully, if we go to the very small farmers, farmers who have very small size of land, their main source of income is wages and animals. So these are the farmers whose land size is very small. So their main source of income is wage and animals. If we come to big farmers, rich farmers, we see that their main source of income is crops means cultivation, right, along with animals. So they are into animals also, but their major source of income, if you look at the proportion, crops form a big proportion of their income. So what do we observe from here? Small farmers depend more on wages and animals. So guys, if you have to take care of Indian farmers, do you need to make a policy so that the farmers are able to get more income through animal husbandry and related activities? Yes, because that is one of their main sources of income. Now we are going to look into the land holding pattern in the Indian agriculture. So see, this is a very interesting graph. You know what it tells us? It tells us that 86% which means more than 85%. So more than 85% farmers in India hold small land plots. So you know earlier, the average size of the plot with Indian farmers was 0.725 hectares in the year 2003. But in 2019, we see that the average plot size has decreased to 0.512 hectares. So what do we observe? We observe that there has been fragmentation of land, which means the size of the land available to Indian farmers has been reducing. It's coming down. And more than 85% farmers, so, so almost 86% farmers in India have a very small land holding. So if you are the government of India and if you have to create policies, what kind of policies would you create? You have to create a policy so that these farmers who have small land holdings, you can create a new method of agriculture, new technology to help them increase their productivity. So this data is very important. So what do we observe here? That share of small farmers have increased. So number of small farmers have increased. Fragmentation of holding has happened. See, earlier 80% of our farmers had small holdings. Now it's 86%. Right? So small farmers are increasing. So overall, what is the policy that we should create for Indian agriculture? What do, did we learn from this year's economic survey? So this year's economic survey tells us that number of small farmers have increased 86%. Average land holding has reduced, right? Somewhere close to 0.5 hectares. Increasing importance of livestock. So number of small farmers went up, the land with the farmer, the size of the land has gone down, hence the farmers are depending more on livestock. So what could be a good policy for Indian agriculture? Number one, we must bring a technology which should help small farmers to increase their production and productivity. This is crucial. Because typically if you see everybody says that we need to bring technology for agriculture at a big level. Yes, agreed. It's right. But how about bringing a technology to help these 86% farmers increase their production and productivity? Very, very important. We must promote non-farm business to help the farmers who have small land size or they are landless. We must focus on allied activities like animal husbandry, dairy farming, etc. And we must promote crop diversification. 
if you remember we had a discussion on crop diversification and we must promote crop diversification towards oil seed pulses and horticulture india is doing very well in horticulture this must be promoted so this should be the future course of action now there is one interesting thing given in the economic survey which i would like to share with you so the economic survey says that if you are government of india you should definitely give some basic subsidies to the farmers because they need it but the economic survey says that if you have one rupee to spend and you are a policy maker if you give that one rupee as subsidy you get some benefits farmers will get some benefits then you give that one rupee for r and d so the economic survey compares that if you have just one rupee and if you give this one rupee for subsidy for farmers and you give this one rupee for promoting research and development the benefits that you will get if you spend one rupee in research and development is huge compared to the benefits that you will get if you give that one rupee for subsidy so the economic survey says that spending more money on research and development brings more benefit for the agriculture and the farmers of course it is right but yes we must give some basic subsidy to the farmers based on the need the economic survey also makes a case and says that we must use new technologies like drones and artificial intelligence so that we can look at new data new analysis etc drones can be used for you know putting pesticides insecticides etc in the agricultural field so we must explore the use of these new technologies in the field of agriculture and the economic survey says that we must promote agri startups startups based upon agriculture because this is where the future lies so thank you so much for being with me in this lecture on indian agriculture thank you